Well, Billy Graham was returning to Charlotte from a speaking engagement. And when he arrived at the airport there, there was a limousine waiting to take him home. As he got out of the plane and went over to the limo, he asked the driver and spoke to him and said, I'm 78 years old, 87 years old, and I've never driven a limousine. Would you mind if I drove it for a while? No problem. Have at it. So Billy got into the driver's seat, and they drove off for home. A short distance down the highway sat a rookie state trooper who had set up his first speed trap. The long black limo passed him doing 70 miles per hour in a 55-mile-an-hour zone. The trooper pulled out and easily caught the limo, and when he walked up to the driver's door, he was surprised to see who was driving. He immediately excused himself, called his supervisor, and said, I know we're supposed to enforce the law, but I also know important people are given certain courtesies. I need to know what I should do because I've stopped a very important person. The supervisor asked, is it the governor? No, he's more important than that. The supervisor responded, oh, so he's the president. The young trooper said, no, he's even more important than that. The supervisor finally asked, well then, who is it? And the young trooper replied, I think it's Jesus because he's got Billy Graham as a chauffeur. <laughs> you know, important people are a part of our world, aren't they? Whether it's Billy Graham or T.D. Jakes or Andre Bocelli or Celine Dion or the President of the United States or other world leaders, there are just different people in our world that are very important. Everybody usually knows who they are, and they literally affect the lives of millions and millions of people, not only in the day in which they live, but usually for generations to come afterwards as well. And today, I would submit to you that in our gospel lesson, we read about one of those very important people, that being John the Baptist. In our lesson today, we hear about someone who we hear a lot about, somebody who's anointed by God to call Israel to repentance, and he does so in a very specific way. He calls them to baptism. And as we read in the gospel lesson today, all of Israel, all of the people in Jerusalem were going out to him. Uh, thousands, if not over time, maybe millions of people going to him to be baptized, to repent of their sins, and to prepare for the coming of the kingdom of God. John the Baptist's coming was actually prophesied in Isaiah, as we read about today, as a voice crying in the wilderness, somebody crying out to the people of God to come back home to come back to the Lord in repentance and to follow him with all of their hearts. He was a very unique person in that he spent a lot of time in places of solitude and in prayer. He wore garments of camel hair. He ate locusts and wild honey. If you will, John the Baptist was definitely organic. And he was a person who stood out to the people of Israel. He not only stood out to them in terms of what he ate and what he wore, but also, I believe, in terms of the anointing that God had given him. People knew that John the Baptist had been called by God, that he was holy, and that God has something to say to them through him. And that's why they responded the way that they did. And so what is the message of John the Baptist to you and me here today as it was to the people of Israel when he was actually alive? Well, first of all, he proclaimed that the kingdom of God was at hand. You know, so often when we hear that proclamation, we think of the idea that, well, yes, Jesus is one day going to come back for his church. And we think of his incredible coming on the clouds with all of his angels for the final rendering of judgment. But John was also talking about something in the moment. And I think the Lord talks to us about it in the moment as well. John was proclaiming to the people of Israel that the kingdom of heaven was at hand right now. That the kingdom of heaven was breaking forth through his ministry to them right now. And that God was calling them 
to enter into a baptism of repentance right now. Not tomorrow, not when they died and went to be with God in glory, but right now God was calling them to repentance. And beloved of God, I think that's something that's very important for you and me to hear as well this day. That as you and I reflect upon God's word, as you and I hear it, as you and I hear God speaking sovereignly in our life, whether it's through his scripture or through other people or through life events, God is not so much speaking to us about something that's going to happen decades from now, but God is speaking to you and me right now and waiting for us to respond to him and follow him right now. And that's very important. We also know that John was proclaiming the word of God to everybody that was around him, even if it was unpleasant. You remember the story of John and his disciples when uh, John confronted King Herod at the time because he was involved in an incestuous marriage. And usually kings aren't too pleased to hear that from anybody, let alone a prophet of the day. Even though the king at that time respected John and imprisoned him, ultimately it would cost John his head. Because John had the courage and John also had the anointing of God to proclaim the unpleasant truth as well in the moment. And I think that's another important thing for you and I to remember about people that have been called by God to proclaim his word. If you happen to be in the presence of someone who is uh, supposed to be proclaiming God's word to you, but is always saying things to you that you want to hear, um, beware. Beware. Because really, somebody who is proclaiming God's word to you at some point will say something to you that will offend you. Whether that will be from a place like this or in a counseling room with them or maybe out and about, they might even say something that's offensive to you and they, they won't even know it. And it's because God is speaking through them. God is using them as uh, a voice to speak something to you that maybe you need to change in or maybe you need to repent of. And so what I say to you is that this is, uh, this is important in the ministry of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is not only welcoming people to repentance, he's not only rejoicing with them that they are coming to the Father and renewing their relationship with him, but he also loves people enough to speak the truth to them and to let King Herod know, yes, even a king, that what he was doing was sin and that he needed to repent. And so this is important for you and I to realize that as someone is, who is truly proclaiming God's word will be somebody who will encourage us. They will be somebody who will encourage us to repent and return to the Lord in every way and in every sense of the word. And there will be times where they will share words with us which are incredibly encouraging and uplifting and loving and we rejoice in. But there will be, also be times where we will be rebuked. And that is important because that is part of their ministry to us. There is something else that John said, though, in the gospel lesson today that is important for you and I to hear, and that was this. John said very clearly to the people of Israel and to you and me that there was someone more important coming after him. As important as John the Baptist was, as much as the people of Israel recognized him, prophesied in the book of Isaiah, as much as they heralded John the Baptist as a holy man of God, a, a front runner of Jesus, if you will, John the Baptist himself said, there was someone coming who was greater than him. In fact, this person was so much greater than him that he wasn't even worthy to untie his sandals. That was a pretty awesome person. And that person was none other than Jesus Christ. John goes on to say in Mark 1.8, I baptize you with water. John's ministry was a baptism, a water baptism of repentance. It was a calling forth of the people of Israel to go into the river Jordan and to be baptized as a sign of their repentance before the living God. That was John's ministry. He said, I baptize you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
and that continues to this day to be Jesus' ministry in your life and in my life. Let me just say that we all celebrate the heart of Jesus' ministry as one as of Savior and salvation. There's a reason why there's a cross of nails in the middle of our church behind the altar, and that is because that is the central thing that you and I celebrate, is that Jesus is the Savior of the world and the Savior of everyone who will confess him as Lord, who repents of their sin and comes before him and desires to follow him as their Lord and Savior. But one of the things that you and I so often don't hear is another important aspect of Jesus' ministry, and that is he has come to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Baptize simply means to immerse, to fill, to overflowing in a way that is powerful and transforming. Do you know that in Middle Eastern countries that people that confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Muslims who come to Christ, um, that is one thing. You know, sometimes actually that can be somewhat tolerated. But that when they actually are baptized, that is when they need to fear for their lives. Because that is when Muslims and Buddhists and others who see that or hear of that really believe the commitment. They've been baptized. It's an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And that's when their lives are in danger. And so this baptism of the Holy Spirit by Jesus is very important. It's important for you and I to hear that and to receive that. The pulpit commentary shares, it's as though John is saying Christ will pour his Holy Spirit so abundantly upon you that he will cleanse you from all your sins and fill you with holiness, love, and all of his excellent graces. He did this visibly on Pentecost and does so invisibly through the sacraments of baptism and confirmation in which Christ baptizes the soul. So we read today in this gospel lesson that John received, that Jesus received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let me just say that that should put to rest any kind of argument that you or others might have about re- whether the baptism of the Holy Spirit is meant for today or not. There are people who I went to seminary with And there are people that I know who to this day are still arguing about that. (laughs) Whether or not we're supposed to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. There are people that teach in terms of dispensationalism that that only happened during the time of Jesus. And that for us right now, that is no longer a reality. I say to you here today, that is false teaching. That the reality for you and me here today is that part of the heart of Jesus' ministry is to come and baptize us with the Holy Spirit, to fill us to overflowing in a way that is beautiful, that is transforming, that renews us, that gives us, a, gives us a life that is abundant and only possible because of our connection with the Holy Spirit. One of the other things you'll notice about Jesus is that as he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this is when his ministry begins. His ministry does not begin until he goes to the River Jordan, is baptized by John, and then he's driven by the Holy Spirit out into the desert to be tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. And this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. We'll also notice that for Jesus, as he continues his brief ministry upon earth, the most powerful ministry that anyone has ever seen or ever will, for three brief years, he does it continually in intimate relationship with the Father and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And what I say to us here today, I think, is very important. I believe Jesus is our model. Again, I don't know who other people in the world are following, but as a disciple of Jesus Christ, I am trying to follow Jesus. There are even people in the church today who who would simply say that Jesus is a nice prophet, He's a good teacher. He's an example just like anybody else, like the Buddha or like Muhammad or any other great religious person. And I say to you, he is someone far greater than that. He is Messiah. He is Savior. He is Lord. He is the one and only Son of God. And in that, he is our example. He 
He is the model. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is the one that you and I are to follow. And I say to you here today that if he began his ministry after he was filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, I would say to you here today, our ministry has not begun until that has fully and completely happened in our lives. So I would say to you here today that I am remembering before you a very important person, somebody even more important than Billy Graham, (laughs) as important as he is and as much as God has used him, the person of the Holy Spirit. And as you and I are in this season of Advent, this season of waiting, this season of preparation and preparing for the coming of Jesus, this season of reflecting on our Lord and the beauty of his life and the example of his life and the model of his life. Hear with me the words of this gospel afresh today that Jesus was baptized, immersed with the presence of and the reality of the Holy Spirit. I love the pulpit commentary which shares for us about the sacraments of the church today, how we have received the Holy Spirit in the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. But let me say, I believe that for many Christians, that's where it ended. (laughs) That's where the relationship with the Holy Spirit ended. Let, Let me just say that as Jesus was baptized by John in the River Jordan, And filled with the Holy Spirit, the sign of the dove upon him, a a physical sign of what was happening inwardly in his being, that that was a relationship with the Holy Spirit in his earthly ministry that was just the beginning. And the same needs to be true for you and for me. I'm grateful for the relationship that each and every one of us have with the Holy Spirit at this point in time. But I would say to you here today that I believe the Holy Spirit desires an even more intimate relationship with each one of us, one that is growing and more real each and every day of our lives. Let me share with you, for me, what that looks like each day. Um, Each day in my life, I kind of look, I try to look at my life like a sieve in relationship to the Holy Spirit ideally, and that, as you know, a sieve is something that water flows through. Uh, We use a sieve or a colander to drain our spaghetti with, things like that. And I kind of envision my own life as a sieve in terms of the Holy Spirit, always needing the filling and presence and refilling of the Holy Spirit and praying that the Holy Spirit and being open to the Holy Spirit ministering out through me and touching other people's lives in ways that I know and in ways I can't even begin to comprehend. And so I find in my daily life, in relationship with the Spirit, asking to continually be filled. Lord, please fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit this day. And actually, for me, I begin right when I get up in the morning. It's pretty soon after my feet hit the floor, because that's just how much I need the Spirit's presence in my life. Throughout the day, as I'm encountering different people in different situations, whether it be a hospital visit or talking with someone, or praying with someone. Maybe I'm tired at midday. I again say, Holy Spirit, I need your direction. What would you have me speak into this situation? How would you guide and lead us? I just got done with some marriage counseling before this service. I prayed with the couple and asked that the Holy Spirit would be present in their life and my life and bless this journey that we're sharing together as they make the journey to become husband and wife in February. And so... There are many instances throughout one day where I am constantly inviting the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit into my life to empower me, to give me grace, to give me strength, to give me patience behind the, the little old lady or man from Pasadena who's in the fast lane at Naples, right? Those moments where I desperately need God's grace. And so I want to encourage you here today to realize that our relationship with the Holy Spirit is something that you and I need 
to foster. I believe the reason why the church is bereft of power, I believe the reason why the church in the West in particular is not experiencing the anointing and the power of God's presence the way in which we could is because in reality, we don't really have a real relationship with the Holy Spirit that is living, that is active, that is connecting, that is conversant, that is intimate, that is living, that is vibrant, that is happening on a moment-by-moment and daily basis. God wants that for you. God gave you the Spirit's presence that you might enjoy that presence and embrace that presence and welcome that presence as a beautiful relationship within your life. I invite you here today more deeply into that relationship. I invite you here today, like Jesus, to this day be baptized afresh, be filled anew with the Holy Spirit. And as you and I are, to not be afraid. (laughs) To not be afraid to surrender, to let go of control, and to allow the Holy Spirit to guide and lead us wherever God would take us. Whether it be out into the wilderness like the Spirit led Jesus to be tempted and to be prepared for ministry or be led to pray for somebody for healing or mercy, forgiveness, or grace. May you and I this day be open to the powerful presence of the Spirit.